Okay, so this is Hidden Haskell Gems number one, Wrangling Monad Transformer Stacks. I'm your host, Brian Hurt. Um, the slides, as usual, are available on my GitHub repository. I posted this and a whole bunch of other links to the Meetup web page, uh, to the Meetup message board for this meeting. Um, I'll be covering a fair number of different um, packages and, and libraries that you might want to look at, so I didn't want everyone madly scrambling to write down notes, so I wrote them all for you. So this is what I hope to be the, the first of several talks that I want to give on tricks and libraries and the like of the Haskell community that I don't think get as much publicity as they deserve either because they're not, you know, big and important like Warp or ASON or, or, or libraries like that, or because they're theoretically not that interesting, like they're not Yoneda or anything. Not, not to diss on either, either of those categories, it's just that there's a lot of very useful stuff in Haskell that just doesn't have the marketing that it should. And in fact, several of the libraries I'll be talking about tonight a couple of them I was more than two-thirds of the way through re-implementing before I discovered that they, oh wait, that already existed. So the point of this is to go, a lot of this stuff already exists. So this is episode number one. I wanted to sort of focus on Monad transformer stacks and some of the problems and the solutions you run into. And I'll be covering a little bit, I, I want to start with just sort of a quick reintroduction so people know what I'm talking about when I talk about monads and monad transformer stacks. This is something that shows up a fair bit when you're doing, I hate to use the term real programming because it is, it is such a look down your nose term, but if you're like implementing web servers and, you know, user apps and so on, monad transformers are something you, you run into quite a lot. So I wanted to start by answering a question that I've heard a lot, and it's a very good question. And the answer is, how do you structure a Haskell program in the large? When you're architecting a Haskell program, you know, what tools are you using? What questions are you answering, et cetera? And this is, this is a question I hear a lot, and it's a good question. And part of the answer is define your monads. This is only part of the answer. I'm, I'm not sure anyone knows the entire answer here. This is something we as a community are still figuring out. But a large chunk of the answer is define your monads. A lot of the other answer I wanted to point out, there was a great talk given by Ron Minsky of Jane Street Capital called Effective ML. And I posted that link as well. Um, that covers a lot of the stuff I'm not, I'm not going to mention and I'm not going to bring up here. He's talking about OCaml, but if you simply, when he says modules and interfaces and functors, you think type classes, it all applies. It's a great talk, I highly recommend it. If you wanna know how to structure um, ML-like programming languages, it's something to look at. But he didn't talk about monads and monad transformers because that is very much sort of a Haskell-specific part of how you design programs. So a monad, quick refresher, is, I mean, it's a number of different things. It's a burrito among other things. Um, but in our, in our terms, it's a computation returning a value of a given type in a domain where some condition holds true. And this is important at a later point. That enforce, enforces a sequence on, on the events and the effects that you do in that monad. So. We have a lot of examples of monads we might use, we might see in a real program. We might go, you know, most programs need to do I.O. at some level, so we have the monad, the domain where you can do I.O. You can have a domain where you can error out. Instead of producing a value, you might generate an error instead. You have the domain where you have a pool of database connections, if, you, if for example, you're talking to a database which is something you might want to do. Um, you might say the domain where I actually have a connection to the database. That is a domain in my, in my program. And you might even go, you are in a transaction 
in that connection to that database. So these monads, you tell me if these are the monads that you're defining in your program, you've just told me a heck of a lot about what your program is doing. What are the problems you're going to be encountering? What are the things you're going to be doing? You haven't narrowed it completely down, but you have told me a heck of a lot. And we now have a fairly good structure for what your program looks like. And you might notice these sort of form concentric, you know, subdomains. The domain where you can error out, you might go, is a complete, is a proper subset of the domain where you can do I.O. And likewise, where you have a DB pool and have a DB connection are inner more, inner more domains. That if I'm here in the DB connection, I have a DB pool, I can error out, and I can do an I.O. I can do all of these at the same time, right? So this is implemented in Haskell as monad transformers. What monad transformers are is there are monads that can stack on top of domains, if you will, that can stack on top of other domains. So I can go, I'm in domain X and domain Y at the same time. So you might go have, we might have in our program these example monads. We might define the with error monad. This is the accept T. The accept T monad is a monad transformer that stacks on top of, in this case, the IO monad and goes, this means we either return an IOA or a string. And the string is implicitly our error result. Something went wrong. Here's the error message. And we can define with pool A is our monad transformer that our reader T the reader T is another monad transformer that just says we have this value we can ask for. And the, fun and the function is literally called ask, that we can just go, I want to ask for the database pool. I have this database pool I can read. And likewise, with con A is our connection. We have a specific connection now that we can ask for. And we can go, okay, we've gotten a connection to the database. Please give it to me. Right? So these form the exact same structure as our original, dom original domain. So it's one to one and on to. So we have the IO monad, the with error monad, with pool, with con, etc. So this is how we're structuring our program and the, and, and, and the domains of our program. And when, when do we have certain pieces of information? I wanted to start with trick number one that we've seen here before. In fact, I've learned it at a previous um, um, Haskell meetup. Generalized new type deriving. Now, I didn't understand until I, until I learned this, I didn't understand why do you have new type? That so you have data which defines a new type, literally defines a new type, new constructors, etc. You have type you know, you can go type foo A equals something. This is a type, you know, this is a, a, a um, like, like, a C, like a C type def. It's literally a, a type synonym. But why do you have new type? You have this sort of neither fish nor fowl. Well, what new type does is it allows us to define what looks like it, what looks like to us a new data constructor, but under the hood, it's simply a type alias, right? So this allows us to control, I can define my with error type and go, but outside of the module in which I define it, you can't tell that it is this monad transformer stack. And so you can only do the things with it that I say you can do and I can control what access you have and what operations you can have, right? Generalized new type deriving allows us to inherit the type class implementations when we do this. The major problem with creating a new type is the old type has all these useful type classes defined for it. Monad and monad trans and applicative and functor and a whole bunch of others we're, we're going to be hearing about tonight. 
we'd like that to be in our new type class as well without having to rewrite all of the definitions every time. So generalized new type driving allows us to go just pull the type classes from the from the from type I'm, I'm, I'm aliasing. It, they're the same, just, just use them. So as an example here, this is the language pragma. You do have to turn on generalized new type deriving. There's, I think I've seen some talk that that may be become a standard, that it may become a standard. I don't know. Until then, this is a very common um, um, we have, we're in a module here. I'm defining my new with trans mod, monad. This looks like the, the generalized new type, it looks like I'm doing a data declaration here. But I'm only allowed to have one constructor. With data, I can have two or 50 or however many constructors. Here I only can have one. And that is the type I'm wrapping. And I can just go driving functor, applicative, monad, monad trans, should have had monad trans here. Then I can just go, I can write functions like ndb trans, which actually executes my monad with a tran in a transaction. So it starts the transaction and cleans up afterwards, right? And ndb trans can see that this is just with db con. But outside of here, you can't see that. So we can enforce the we can enforce the constraint that you can't call a function in with trans without going through in db trans. We can force correctness here. We can force we can prove that we're not screwing up and think we're in a transaction when we're really not. So the general rule here is don't make Ed commit sad. He, had this, he has this wonderful talk, I should have posted a, um, a link to it, I will, where he talks about why type classes were defined the way they are. And he said it always makes him sad when he runs across the library that could implement freely a, a type class and didn't. And now he has to either work around that it didn't implement this type class or go through and you know, do a pull request on the library, go implement this type class. With generalized new type driving, the cost of just pulling in the type classes is small enough that it's, that unless there's, re unless there's a good reason not to, I think my advice is to just always pull stuff in, to, to be liberal in what type classes you implement. So, I wanted to get started on the first problem. So once you start working with monad transformers and we go, okay, now we have, we have our domains defined. We have our, monad, we have our monads defined. And you start discovering very quickly, one of the first problems you hit is what I call the lift, lift, lift problem. And where this comes in is we wanna write code. We want this message, we wanna write a function called print message. And it, op and, and it executes in our WISCON monad that we defined in some other module. And we just want to do some I.O. here. We just want to print a message here. What we're actually doing isn't important here. I just want to do something simple. We want to do I.O. So this doesn't work because, sorry, this doesn't work because put string line is in the I.O. monad. And here we're saying we're in the WISCON monad. But what you have to do, there is a function called lift which lifts you one step up a monad transformer stack. So if you're in IO, you can do one lift and be in, your, in our error con, do another lift to get into our, do another lift to get into our D, with, D, with uh, DB pool, and then a third lift, lift to be into with con. So we have to write the code. We want to do a print message here. We have to write this code with this lift, lift, lift here because we're, we're three monad stack transformers up and we got to do three lifts to get up there, right? This gets really annoying really quick, as you can probably guess. First of all, it's ugly as heck. I mean, lift, lift, lift. Second of all, how many lifts do you need again? 
I can never remember that. Is it two, three, four? Keep adding lifts until the compiler stopped complaining. What? And of course, the problem with that is you change the definition of withcon to add or remove a a a, a monad transformer stack, and now you got to go through and fix all of your code to go. Okay, it was three lifts, but now it's two or four, and we got to fix it again. You got to do this with every I/O function. Every time you want to print a message, every time you want to connect to the database or do a query against the database or anything in the I.O. monad, you got to do this again. If you want to have access to the database connections pool, it's got to be lifted once. Different number of lifts than from I.O. If you want to do, you know, if you want to have a function that executes in, in the with error, well, that's got to be lifted twice. Well, that's why I can never remember. It's which, which, where are you coming from and where are you going to? And of course, lastly, if we look at it, print message works in a lot of other places. I mean, it works in with con, with error, it works in I.O. It, it, it's pretty general. So the first solution to this, I'm going to give you not one, not two, not three, four different solutions to this. Solution number one, Monad I.O. This is in the control monad.io.class library and the transformers package by Andy Gill and Ross Patterson. Uh, this is, I gave you a link to this. This is up on the, the message board. So the key function is called lift.io. The nice thing about this is this automatically does the right number of lifts. Whatever the right number of lifts are, it will lift from the IO monad all the way up into whatever monad you want it to be in, in one operation. And all the standard transformers implement monad IO, including reader T and accept T. So we can get it for almost free. All we have to do is add in our, in our, you know, in our deriving, you know, generalized new type deriving, our deriving um, expression, all we have to do is, oh yeah, we implement monad IO too and we get it automatically. So this allows us to write much nicer code, right? Here's our print message again. Print message is sitting here going, I don't care what monad it is, so long as it's some stack of monad transformers on top of the IO monad. So long as, I don't care what subdomain of IO we're in, so long as we're in a subdomain of IO, right? And it just does M unit. And it, now we just do lift IO in our put string line, and it works correctly. We don't have to remember how many lifts we have to put. If we change the, the definitions of the monads at a later point, we don't have to come back and fix this. We can just, just do lift IO, and all of our problems are solved. So, works everywhere. So the upside. The reason I'm giving you four different solutions, by the way, is they all have different upsides and downsides, and which ones you want to use depends upon where exactly you want to draw the line. So the advantage of Monad IO is it's Haskell 98 compliant, which means it works everywhere in Haskell land. The downside is it only works on Monad transformer stacks on top of IO. If you want to sit on top of STM or the ST monad or the ID monad or anything else, whatever your, if your base is something other than IO, it doesn't work. The other problem is, and I'll get back to this, it's, an, it's the express elevator. It only goes from the lobby all the way to the penthouse without stopping on any of the intermediate floors or starting on any of the intermediate floors. So it only goes from IO all the way up, right? So solution number two, it's monad base. It's in the, pack, it's in the uh, module control monad base in the package transformers base by dear, I hope I get this right, Mikhail Vorstoff and Baz Van Dyke, I hope. I apologize to these people, these fine, fine gentlemen, if I've just horribly mangled their names. I'm an American, we're idiots, I'm sorry. So, Monad base 
has a similar function. Instead of lift IO, we now have lift base. The advantage of lift base here is it goes, we have a multi-parameter type class here. We're going, we have a base monad of B and a top monad of M, and we're going from B up to M. And it doesn't care what B is. B could be IO, B could be STM, B could be ST, etc., etc., etc. So if you need other base IO, base monads other than IO on your monad transformer stack, lift base rather than lift IO gives you that ability. So the upside is it works as any monad as base. Downside is it is GHC it has a GHC it uses the GHC specific extension called multi-parameter type classes with functional dependencies. And I'll get that get to that in just a minute. And of course, it only ha goes from the goes from the base to the top again. Express elevator. So I wanted to dig into the multi-parameter type classes because that's an actual important. You know, why do we have these multiple different solutions rather than just the one right solution? So multi-parameter multi type classes, your standard Haskell 98 type classes can only take one type parameter. So you, you can have a num A or a monad M or something like that. So with multi-parameter type classes, we relax that restriction. And you can go, your type class can now have multiple type parameters. The functional dependencies allow us to, I'm, I'm simplifying a bit here, um, the functional dependencies allow us to go that one type, one or more types can be derived from the other types. So in this case, let me try that explanation again. Well, in this case, we have two parameters here on our monad base type class. We have B and M. B is the type of our base monad transformer. That, that will be IO or whatever. And M is the top of the stack. So that will be like WISCON or INTRANS or whatever, right? But this says, this hunk of code right here says, if we know M, B is totally defined. There is only one B. For any given M, there is only one B which makes sense for any given monad stack, there is only one base. And if we know what monad stack we're talking about, we know what base it will, it will be. It will be a different base for different monad stacks. This, this monad stack may have IO as its base. That one may have STM as its base. But if we know which monad stack we're talking about, we know which base we're talking about. So that is what the, what this, the pipe M arrow B says is if we know M, we can tell B. This is, this is called functional dependencies. It's actually more powerful than that. This is not a full introduction to functional dependencies. It's actually a very neat looking extension. But for our purposes, what this tells us is, yes, this is a multi-parameter type class, but it acts like our classic single parameter type class. We get back to that nice goodness of if we know one type, we know what type class we're dealing with, right? And that just gives us, now we can do lift base goes from BA to MA. So our third solution called monad stack in the, pack, in the module control monad dot monad stack in the monad stack package by some dweeb, we don't care. Um, again, we have our lift function. In this case, lift from. Again, we have a multi-parameter type class here, M and N. He chose different letters because he didn't know about monad base when he wrote this. And again, we have M A to N A. That allows us to lift from one monad to a higher monad in the stack. Now the advantage here is, is that notice the lack of the functional dependency. So the upside is of this implementation is it can go from anywhere in the stack to anywhere higher in the stack. 
So this is no longer the express elevator from the, the foyer to the penthouse. This is now the, the local elevator that stops on all the floors, but it still only goes up. And the other huge advantage is you, know, you only need to implement monad trans to use. Actually implementing, um, implementing new versions of this is a little bit tricky for reasons I'll get into in just a minute. Um, and so the, the preferred way to use this is to just export monad trans from your generalized new type driving and then use the default implementations. Downside, GHC specific, we have a true multi-parameter type class. We do not have a functional dependency making it look like a single parameter type class with a couple of types that are fully derived. This is in any, any, two, any two types can be shoved in here. And also the limit is it only works on real monad transformers. And what I mean by that, I will explain in just a couple of minutes by going, showing you a library that, has, that works on other stuff. So the next library I want to visit really quick is Monad Compose. It's in control.monad.lifter and Monad Compose by James Candy. So it has, it's called, its lift function is called LF. And again, it, the, the, mon, the type class is called lifter, MN, and it just lifts from any monad up to anything higher. The upside of this library, it is by far the most general. All of the other libraries, there are monad transformers stacks and monad-like things that they don't work on. Um, this works on pretty much everything. If you have monad plus instances, you have a lot of other stuff hello, uh, that I freely admit I don't understand yet. The downside to this, and I think it is a pretty big downside, so I'll warn you ahead of time, is fully multi-parameter type classes with overlapping instances and undecidable instances. I want to explain why this is a problem. This, by the way, has bit me. So the problem with multi-parameter type classes that you don't get into with single parameter type classes is it becomes very easy to define multiple different implementations of the type class for the same two types. This is especially easy if you're, if you're defining the instances in a lot of ways. So like if you're going, if you implement monad trans, here is the default implementation of my monad lift function, right? So it's very easy to get into situations where you have multiple different implementations. But now the question becomes, what happens then? The compiler is going, you know, remember type class implementations are global. The compiler is going, I got two different implementations to this type class for this pair of types. Two different ways I can derive it. What do I do? Without overlapping instances and undecidable instances, the compiler just throws up its hands and goes, error. And you, you know, I've got, you know, I got two different instances. I don't know which one to pick. I'm just going to yell at you. And of course, this can get you into a really bad situation where if you add this instance to the, to, to the type class, you run into the error situation because in, in case X, it's overlapping with some other implementation. But if you don't add it, then in case Y, you, have an, you don't have an implementation at all. So you can literally get into a situation where if you add this chunk of code, you have one error. If you remove it, you get a different error. But what do you do then? If somebody knows the answer to this, please let me know. <laughs> um, the answer is just don't go there. With overlapping instances and undecidable instances, the compiler just picks one. Doesn't give you an error. I'm not even sure it gives you a warning. It just goes, oh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That's the one I'll use. If the two instances really are equivalent and you really don't care which one gets picked, then you're okay. If you only think you don't care, but you really do, I guarantee you the compiler will pick the wrong one. It, it is 100% it is guaranteed except if you depend upon the compiler picking the wrong one, and then in that case, it'll pick the right one just to screw with you. 
So we're Haskell programmer. You have a question? No. There's, uh, the question is, is there some linguistic hack you can go to go, in this case, use this compile, you know, use this instance? Um, no, not to my knowledge. And I think the, uh, the response of the GHC maintainers to that would be, you shouldn't ought to be here anyways. <laughs> so I'm not speaking for them, however. So this is the problem was the last two instances, the last two classes we had that had multi-parameter type classes. Um, Monad Compose uses the compiler pick one. Now I've forgotten the name of my own dang library. <laughs> Monad Stack, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, you just gives you the error. Um, I think my advice is when you're asking, you know, if you were asking me what should I use, Always use Monad IO. Always derive Monad IO. It's basically free. It's Haskell 98. There are no downsides to it. If you know you're lifting from IO, just go, okay, I'm in Monad IO. Uh, derive Monad base unless you know you need non GHC support. Um, which is, so most of the time, I don't think about it all that much. I go, I'm in Monad IO and I'm in Monad base IO. And here I'm, you know, happy as a clam. I would use Monad Trans and Monad Compose, a Monad Stack, if needed. Monad, yeah, Monad Trans and Monad. Yeah. I would use Monad Stack and Monad Compose if you actually have a demonstrated need. I think my advice would be, even though it's you know my library, I'm advising you not to use. My advice would be, don't go there unless you know you need it. And then obviously, if you have to go there, only go to Monad Compose if you really need the full generality, if you need to do this on Monad Plus and um, other things. Um, and of course, don't feel bad about driving multiples of these. Just, you know, do, do your generalized new type driving and just suck in everything you need. So all of the functions we've been talking about now We've been going up the Monad transformer stack. We've been going, you know, especially from like IO up into with con, etc. We've been going lifting stuff from lower monads up into higher monads. Sometimes you, however, you do need to go the other direction. You do need to take a with con monad and go in this, I need to pack it down into a IO to do something. And a classic example of why you need this is in control, in the module control exception, which is how exceptions are defined in Haskell, there's a nice little function called catch that implements your catch statement in Haskell. It takes an IOA, which it then executes, and if this IOA throws an accept, doesn't throw an exception, it just gets returned. And if it throws an exception, this function is called with the exception E, this is your catch exception that produces another IOA. So in most languages, catch is a li language feature. In Haskell, it's a library function. But you might notice a slight problem here. You can take IOs as inputs, especially right here. If we're in, if we want to catch an exception in our with con monad, how do we do that? Well, there's a library that helps you do that. Now, this is the one, by the way, I was more than two-thirds of the way through writing when I found out it existed. So it's Monad, the, the library is Monad Control. It's in the module Control, Monad, Trans Control, and the Monad Control by Baz Van Dyke and Anders Kaysorg. Again, my apologies for mangling your names. So the key part, this is actually a fairly large and complicated library and actually trying to rewrite it helped me understood, understand why it is the way it is. So I'm going to 
try to give you a flavor, uh, some, some minimal understanding of why this library works the way it works. Don't worry too much if you're not really getting it. There's a, there's a much easier way to deal with this stuff I'll introduce in a moment. But I wanted to just give you an idea in case you actually have to do this, how, how this works. The, the, key, the key type class is the monad base. And again, notice we have a multi-parameter type class here, but with a functional dependency. So we have some stack M with a base B. And if we know the stack, we know what the base is. So this is still, this acts like a one parameter type class, even though there are two parameters involved here. And there are three types here, STMA, the, the restore M function, and the lift with. And I want to just step through this one at a time. So it is a monad transformer stack on top of base B. So the STMA, we're going to need, when we pack down, we have a monad transformer stack, and it has all this information in it. It has our current database connection. It has our pool of database connections. It has whether or not we've errored out yet or not. So we're going to need some sort of data structure to hold all of this information while we're in the IOA. And in this case, it's called, that's the STM, capital S, capital M. Um, not really fond of this name because there's also a very important monad called the STM monad for software transactional memory. Um, this is the state of your monad. Uh, it's a bit of name overloading confusion I'm not the happiest with, but oh well. So restore M is the easiest function to understand. If we have the state of the, of, of the monad that we saved at some later point, unpack it and make it our current state. So if we had somewhere previously, we had the, the you know, stored our database connection, our pool and our error result, unpack that and make it our current state. Uh, the, with the reader monad, this isn't very interesting. With like the state monad, this becomes a lot more interesting because this sets what value your state monad has. So that's pretty simple and easy to understand. Lift base width is the key function. So let's pick this apart just a little bit slower. So run in base here is going to be our function that packs us down. So run in base you can't see it. This is going to be our pack down function. I'll co cover that in a moment. So we get a function that, we have a function that gets a run in base function and returns some BA. And it returns MA at the top. And our run in base is our pack down function. It converts an MA to a STMA in the B monad. So our run in base function is the, is what lets us convert, lets us go down from the WISCON monad all the way down to the IO monad. This is confusing, I know. <laughs> so the question is, why don't we just do it the simple way? Why don't we just have a pack that packs us down into a, an, you know, from a WISCON into an IO in our state. The answer is this function, the pack down function, depends upon the current state of the monad. What actions have you performed? Are you, have you errored out? Did you write, have you done IOs? Where are you in the sequence of IOs, et cetera? So the pack down function is only valid at a given point in time, at a given monad. So rather than just give you the function this way, it pulls the standard trick, with a smart, it pulls the standard trick of having you pass in a fun, having you pass in a closure. This says this run in base is only valid as you're executing this function. So that gives us a, 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 gives us a context in which the pack down function is valid and it's not universally valid. So 
So we can use this. This becomes a lot easier to understand when you actually look at it and use. So we want to do a my catch function. The my catch function sits in monad base control. This is a combat. Uh, this is a combination of monad base and monad control. That so we have both monad base and monad control f facilities here. The monad M and some exception E. So normal catch, all of these M's are IOs. We want to do this in any monad transformer stack stacked on top of IO. So we write our go function. This gives us our yeah, losing the track. So we have our go function. This actually runs in IO. So given our run in base, this gives us an IO of our state. And it actually calls catch. And I misnamed run here very badly. This is run is our pack down function. So we're going to call this, we're going to get this, we're going to have this called by the library with run. Run will pack us down from an IO, uh, from, from an MA to an IOA. And then allow us to actually call catch. We can then just go lift base with go. Lift base with then calls go with the proper pack down function that is only valid at that point, at this point right here in the monad. So whatever, whatever IO actions have happened before this, whatever, you know, erroring out has happened before this will be reflected in the pack down function. And once we have our state and have caught our exception, we can just restore it. Now this is a little bit confusing, but there's only one problem with this function. One tiny little problem. You shouldn't ever write this function because it is already written for you. <laughs> All of this stuff, if you didn't understand what I've just been saying, it's okay. You can still have the full ability to ca catch exceptions anywhere because there's, nice there's this nice module called lifted base. And what lifted base, it's in control exception dot lifted in lifted base by Baz Van Dyke and Anders Kaysorg. And what it does is it just went through and all of the common places where you need to pack stuff down into IOs to call stuff. So catching exceptions, um, doing, you know, spawning threads, um, you know, doing concurrent MVAR work, system.timeout. They just already wrote all of this code for you. So you can just now you can just import control exception it lifted instead of control exception and it's already done the work for you and it works in any monad transformer stack that you care to name that's a stack on top of io that makes sense so don't feel sad if you got lost there in that middle part you're not alone <laughs> so wrapping up here really quick what we've learned so far you use monads to define the regions of your program. Generalized new type driving lets us make sure that Edward commit is never sad. Uh, we have a range of lifting options that we can choose from depending upon our needs and tastes and how risk adverse we are. Use monad based control to lift monad combinators when we need to. And the common ones are already, uh, already exist in lifted base. One last plea. I am looking for more Haskell gems. So if you know of libraries that you think don't get, that aren't big complicated libraries, and aren't theoretically deep libraries, that you think don't get the love that they deserve, let me know and they may show up in a future, future uh, sequel to this talk. Um, email me, be heard at Gmail or post to the use group or just come up to me at the bar or whatever. And that's it.
Well, I do want to reiterate, I have posted links to all of these uh, libraries um, to the uh, to the meetup message board. So you can just go there and get all of them. And the uh, talk to um, uh, the talk by Ron Minsky that I mentioned. And I will post a link to the Edward Commit talk that I mentioned, um, probably like tomorrow, for people who are interested. And do we have any questions? Yes, good question. Yes. So the question is, in real Haskell programming, how often do you have to define your own monads that are not stacks on top of other monads? The answer is very rarely. Um, it's very common for you to define stacks. I mean, you know, the, the stack I, I, I had here is a very obvious one. You might also have a stack for having AWS connections and, and AW, pools of AWS connections and pools of cryptographic random entropy and stuff like that. So you can have lots of different, but they're generally implemented as monad transformer stacks under the hood. So you will have, for instance, you might have a monad which is a monad where you have access to cryptographically secure entropy. But under the hood, it'll just be a monad stage transformer on top of IO to go the monad state holding the pool of entropy, for example. So, but it is very rare for people to define their own base monads. Um, okay. Any other questions? Uh, question in the back. Yes. So the question is, did you actually need the, do you actually need the, 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 the danger the two dangerous ones, the, mul the two multi-parameter lift libraries I mentioned? Um, the answer is generally no, because it is you know it, 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 is, it, is, it is as you said, you can't just do lift. And if you're not doing that many lifts, you, 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 you can export, for example, and it's actually a good idea to export the monad trans that you're just a monad transformer sitting on top of. So with con would probably export monad trans with DB pool. Um, that it's saying, it's explicitly saying, it's not saying which transformer I am, but it is saying I'm a transformer sitting on top of with DB pool. And at that point you could just do a lift and you didn't, wouldn't need to do anything fancier than that. Um, my experience is I don't generally need to do that. It was one case where I needed to do that and thus the library I wrote. But most of the time you don't. And I think with, with good, I think with good library design, you could probably avoid even more of that and thus avoid the dangers of multi-parameter type classes. I think that would be my advice is if you're thinking about going this direction, to stop for a minute and think, is there a way I can design this library so I don't need to? So, any other questions? Yes? So, 
question is, had I heard of Monad Layer before? Answer is no, I haven't, but thank you very much. I will take a look at this. In a future version, I may, may talk about Monad Layer. This is certainly not the do-all, be-all, and end-all of talks on this, on this topic. Any other questions? In the back? Um, I got into a situation, so my problem was I actually had two different stacks sort of going simultaneously and I had one stack of I have a database connection and another stack of I have a AWS S3 connection and I wanted to be able to you know, pick up an S3 connection. I had, I had a common pool object, so I just had pools. So the pools object had um, uh, cryptographic random numbers, it had AWS connections, it had DB connections, it was just the common pools. But above that I had have a DB connection, have an AWS connection. And I wanted to, in a function where I was executing primarily in a I have a DB connection, I wanted to run out really quick and hit S3 for a reason. So I have a, I had a with S3 connection function, right, that runs an S3 with, you know, an S3 monad on top of a, you know, in a with pool connection, with pool monad, right? But I still needed to go from with pool up to with dbcon. So that was the specific problem. The question was, what was the specific problem I did the multi-parameter type class to solve? That was the specific problem, was I wanted to sort of do jiggery-pokery with monad transformer stacks. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay. One over here. Oh, is that a question, question. over here? Oh. Sorry. Okay, so the good question actually. And he, the question was with functional dependencies, why do, I, why do I need the two types? If one type is always derivable from the other type, why do I need the two types? My answer is what the second type is may change. So, you know, in this case, it's what is the full monad stack I'm working with and what is the base? So I may go for this monad stack, monad stack one, the base is IO. So in that case, the second function, the second type would be I/O. But in this one over here, it might be a monad stack based on the STM, the software transactional memory monad, and so that has a different base. So if I know which stack I am, which monad transformer stack I am, which are the types themselves, I know what the base is. But the base may be different from one one monad stack to the next. Does that make sense? It was, yeah. Yeah. Because it may, why have B, it may be different for different M's. Uh, because it is in, in, in the general type class, why do I need it in the signature? Because in the general type class, I don't know what it is. It is a variable in the type class. So I can't, if, if I just simply said, if I replaced B with IO, then I would be at monad IO. That is exactly what monad IO is. That makes sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no. Okay, so the question is, do the functional dependencies ever, do, do, um, ever only use two types? The answer is no. And there's actually a good paper I should post on this um, where they actually introduce uh, functional dependencies. And they actually have some really interesting um, um, in cases where it's not even, you don't even get down to, in the examples I was showing, you always get down to only having one really free variable, right? So it acts like a single 
variable um, type class. They have some interesting and useful examples where you have multiple types that are, that are possibly free. And so you could, for example, define an add function that takes, or, or better yet, a multiply function that takes an A and a B and returns a C. And I can go, okay, give me A and B together define C. And that's my functional dependency. But this is, I still have two type free type variables here. So this allows me to go, this, this allows me to bo go both floating point multiplication works on this because then A, B, and C are all the same, you know, all double precision. But I can also go scalar vector multiplication works because then I can do scalar times vector goes to vector. So it's actually a really neat and really useful extension to the language. And I've touched on less than 5% of its capability here. That may be a future talk. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank All right, guys. Uh, so thank you, uh, Brian Hurt.